Welcome back to the Peace of Us podcast. I'm your host, Crystal, and I have my lovely husband off to the left of me. That's me. Wait. No. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> you always forgot to, you always forget to say your name. Oh, my name's Aaron. <laughs> and then Aaron. we have a very special guest that I'm so, so excited about. I've been wanting her to be on the podcast for so long. She is so knowledgeable. She has really, really made a difference in our lives. And so welcome to my left, right of me, <laughs> um, the lovely Carrie. Hi, guys. How are you? Welcome, Yay. Carrie. Thank welcome. You, um, Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm really, really excited about this episode, and we have so much fun to cover and go over and all of that fun stuff. Uh, so where do we start? I want to start. So Carrie, for those of you who don't know her, um, she is one of my really, really good friends, and we've been friends for quite a few years, but how did we meet? Okay, so initially, we went to church together before you guys moved to St. John's, and um I would always kidnap Aurora in Relief Society and hold on to her because she was just a tiny baby. Yeah. And I was like, my ovaries were throbbing every time I saw her because she <laughs> was just the cutest thinking thing. Um, and then one day Aaron calls me and um, is wondering if like I had somewhere if I could park a, uh, this ice cream truck that you guys had. <laughs> Because it needed to be plugged in and I had RV parking that had outlets like out on my driveway. So I don't know if we've ever talked about our ice cream truck before, but Aaron and I did used to own an ice cream truck business. <laughs> okay, I don't know what we were thinking and I don't even remember how it came about, to be honest with you. Okay. I, Do you remember? Yeah. So I had been working for this healthcare company for like 10 years, doing that sort of work for like 15 years, most of my life. And I was tired of it. I hated my job. I hated, you know, everything that I did. And so we were trying to figure out different things that we could like transition into. You know, we'd tried day trading. We tried this. We tried that. Well, I loved cooking, and so I loved the movie Chef. And oh, I remember that. I so wanted to start a um, food a food truck, and so we were out there, you know, searching for food trucks, trying to find one that we could buy, you know, cheap, fix it up, and make something work out of it. And we didn't end up finding a food truck. We ended up finding an ice cream truck. Right. Okay, but you have to tell the rest of the story because your HOA wouldn't allow you oh, yeah. to park it on your driveway and paint it. You were painting it this hideous blue color. <gasps> you thought it was hideous? It was hideous for an ice cream truck. I thought it was, it was so cute. It was popping. <laughs> it was popping. It, Do well, you have a we picture? Did, okay, we did a blue. We I have a picture. It was blue, blue with pink writing. Pink with, and then like a pink stripe through it. Yeah. And it was the cutest. I thought it was cute. But no, you were painting it with like a rattle can. <laughs> oh, we, we, were, we literally we were, spray yeah. painted. We were spray painting it. <laughs> Mark hooked me up with spray painting with rattle can, rattle yeah. canning a car. So we had this huge ice cream truck and it was a hideous white when we got it. Yeah. It was dirty and nasty looking. But you wouldn't get very much of it done. You would take it to your house and you would rattle can a part of it and it would come back to my house like barely painted. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like where you would, you would stop where you ran out of paint. It's because the yeah. HOA kept complaining every couple of days we'd yeah. have to take it back and then bring it back. Yeah. And it was it was such a nightmare. And I to be honest with you, we took it out a few times. We made a few cells and I think we took it out three times in total. But ever since you parked it in my driveway, it never moved. You never took it out. After you parked it in my no, driveway, that's it, probably true. it probably never moved. True. You only took it to paint it. And then you called me and you're like, I have all this overspray on my driveway. You know, and like my HOA is tagging me for having this blue paint in my driveway. And so you asked so if I could overspray. paint it in my driveway because I have gravel. And I so don't remember it, all that. It was hysterical. Oh my it was so funny. So that was about a five month <laughs> adventure. Yeah. And then we decided uh, that we didn't need that anymore. We actually <laughs> ended up selling it for a profit. So it was not a loss on a business, but. Yeah, we profited a little bit, but it was not our thing. It was so funny. I think our kids wanted to buy more of the ice cream than we actually sold out. <laughs> but but in that process, we met Carrie and we got to like sit and talk in her driveway and we really got to become friends from that moment. Well, and I remember coming over to your house in a panic because it was my husband's 40th birthday and I was like trying to put together his birthday party 
and you were in the middle of planning your mom's wedding and you stopped everything and you and your girls started putting together like decorations and pulling out all your party platters and oh, I love like everything else like that. And you put together like a little photo booth in our living room and you came over and helped me decorate. And like it was so cute. It wasn't huge, but it was really, really cute. And I, I so appreciated that she's if you don't know by now, Crystal loves parties. She loves I surprises do. like that's her thing. <laughs> Um, and so this was like right up her alley. And so, and then we went on that, um, Relief Society retreat where I taught you how to drive an ATV. Oh yeah. She taught me and got me into riding ATVs and I've loved it ever since, but we had the best time on this ATV and these back roads through the forest. Like it was just such a great time. And I'd go over a bump and Crystal would scream and I'd go over another bump and she'd scream louder. (laughs) (laughs) It was fun times, fun times. It eventually led to us buying a Razor. Yeah. Bombshell Betty. Yeah. Bombshell Betty. Yeah. Yeah. Which I crashed. She did crash. It hurt your back really bad. I did. So I didn't know that I had hurt my back as bad as I did. And um, so I went home and not knowing how bad I was hurt, I continued to ride my horse all summer long. And I went to an event up in Flagstaff and um, rode my horse for like 14 miles. And when I stepped off of my horse onto the ground my back went and it I, I just knew something was wrong and I could barely get my horses like loaded in the trailer and get all my gear put together and stuff like that and I got in the truck and I drove home and by the time I got home my kids had to help me out of the truck oh my and gosh. within a week I was in the hospital and um, within a month I had lost all feeling in my left leg and um, by December I had to have surgery and it was, it was like a year recovery from that, but I was able to get the feeling back in my leg. But I thought I was going to have to get out of horses because how do you ride without the feeling in your left leg? You know what I mean? Right. So, but I literally didn't want you to feel bad for... I feel like so bad. Hurt. No, but I didn't, I didn't ever tell you how badly I was hurt from that because I didn't want you to feel bad. And I felt I so sorry. bad. I literally rewatched that video the other day and I'm like, I felt so bad. And Aaron comes up and he's like, this is what they're for. This is why we got it. <laughs> and then he turns to me and he goes, I'm just glad I wasn't the one that crashed it. <laughs> so she was driving it and she basically yes. went over a bump and... No, it was a jump. It wasn't it a It was bump. a jump. Okay, a jump. <laughs> and she hit the gas instead of the brakes. So when it came down and landed, it broke back, not, back axle. Not quite. I didn't sight the landing of the first jump. And before I could recover from the first jump, we hit a second jump. Uh, and the, the the razor bottomed out and I busted the drive shafts on the back. And uh, yeah, it was a mess. It was crazy. It was a mess. I felt so bad. It was crazy. It was like it a was month fine. old. It was brand new. So, but up until this point, so I mean, obviously Carrie and I were close and like we had a lot of fun together and we did different things, but I didn't really know how strong our relationship would get until we went through something really rough. And yeah. our daughter... Hallie was struggling with anxiety and depression and Mm -hmm. we were going through a lot in that point in our lives and as soon as Carrie saw us like talking about it and opening up about it and all of that she called me and was like can I come to St. John's and talk to you I've struggled my whole life with it well we really we had like a two-hour conversation where I was trying to describe to you how to help her and what to do and things like that and she's she you said something like something along the lines of you know I wish you could just like you know come and explain this to my kids and I was like I'll be up there don't don't threaten me with a good time. You know what I mean? I'll, I will come. And so I drove up there and I spent like three or four days with you. And it was right after you guys had brought Savannah and Lucas in as foster kiddos. Oh, yeah. And so I was I got to get to know them. I was really excited about that. And, you know, I got to see Aurora after so long apart and she had grown like a weed. Oh, yeah. You she know, has grown just, so much. It was it was crazy. But yeah, I'm, I was so glad that I got to come up and visit. It was such a good it was thing. good too because yeah. I didn't, I guess it was kind of hard. It was hard on our family because a lot of us and a lot of the kids didn't really understand depression mm-hmm. and we didn't understand anxiety and we were like, everything's great though and life is great and you have everything you want and can need. How can you be depressed? And for a long time, 
a lot of the siblings and you know and max will even so max is here by the way he's sitting in the background <laughs> normally he's on the podcast he's over there <laughs> we are recording this at night though and we don't have our team to help us so he is working all the cameras and all the equipment our mic that, down so. too this mic isn't working so. yeah one of our mics isn't working right round We're... of applause for max <laughs> yes so thank you max for <laughs> for running the behind the scenes um but max grew up with hallie obviously he's our biological siblings and he was like i don't understand like i truly don't get it and it was until you sat the kids down and you really explained that depression can look different for everybody Mm -hmm. and it can feel different for everyone and it doesn't necessarily have to be a trauma it doesn't necessarily have to be a certain thing Depression and anxiety can hit anybody at any point in your life, no matter what you're going through. Mm-hmm. So I think that was a huge eye opener for me. At that well, point. and for me, I'm I'm extremely visual. Like I could have met you 20 times, and I will remember your face, but not your name. And so the way I describe things, the best way I can, is like kind of painting a picture for him. And what's funny is I actually on my way home from that, I pulled over. I really felt impressed to pull over on long side of the road. And I recorded um, some footage of basically because a lot of people were asking like what actually I said because, you know, in the video, it was just little snippets of it. Yeah. So for those of you who haven't seen it, basically she came up, we video parted it, like part of what she had said. But then a lot of it, we did not end up. Well, there was a lot of sensitive and personal because, information yeah, that I shared. So that would, wouldn't have been appropriate. So but I pulled over on the side of the road and I, I filmed myself kind of talking about what I had shared with your family minus all of my personal experiences yeah. you know what I mean and I still have that footage it's, it's never it's never been posted oh wow maybe yeah. we should post it somewhere maybe on our website on crazypieces.com I'll have to grab it off my it computer it's it's still on the Find cloud. It. yeah <laughs> no I know where it is okay. but um the, so the best way I can describe depression um is for me anyway, um, I don't want to, I don't want to pretend that I'm speaking for everybody as a whole, because depression can look completely different for everybody. Um, but imagine you're in a hole and you can't sit down, you can't get comfortable. You, it's completely pitch black. Um, you look up and there is barely a dot, a little tiny glimmer of a light, but it's so far away. It's just completely out of reach. And you're just so defeated because there's no way you're going to, you're going to be able to reach it. Um, and a lot of people think that you're alone in this dark hole and you're not, you have some demons and everybody's demons are different. But one of the most common demons that are in that hole with you is called, don't tell anybody, don't talk about it. Because you, when you're depressed and you're so low and you're in your darkest hour, you feel like you're the only person that has ever gone through anything like this, that nobody else would understand. And if you bring it up, you're just going to be dramatic or, you know, something like that and getting attention or whatever. And so you don't say anything. And by not saying anything, it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. And so for me, when, um, I think I told you there's a bunch of different types of depression. There's seasonal depression, which you've experienced, Erin. Um, there's postpartum depression. There's bipolar depression, you know, things like that. And so um, for me, experiencing postpartum depression, I went into my OB's office after my second son was born. And it was about 30 seconds before she walked in that door. And my heart was just saying, tell her, tell her, tell her. And she walked in and she said, how are you doing today? And I was holding it together until that point. And she said that. And I was like, I'm not good. You know, and I just lost it. And she stepped outside and told her um, receptionist or whatever to like cancel her next appointment or push it back or whatever. Because she this my appointment was going to take a little bit longer. And she talked with me a little bit. And we were able to find a medication that worked for me. And we had to, you know, take a couple cycles to find the right dose and everything like that. And all of a sudden I felt like myself again. And around the same time, my husband found a medication that worked for him for what he was going through. And with both of us feeling like normal human beings again, it was like we were on a second honeymoon. It was fabulous. Like, oh, that's amazing. Like it was so amazing to come from like the humdrum of my everyday married life and you know you go to work and I take care of the kids and this is how it goes to like we were really enjoying each other's company 
you know, going on dates, going on walks, talking, laughing. I hadn't laughed in so long, Aww. you know, so that was, that was really huge for me. But, um, a little while after that, um, I had a neighbor come to my door and she said that she was on her way to a like parent play day in our, our neighborhood park. And she just got the impression that she needed to come talk to me. And so she dropped her kids off with some of the gals at the park. And I was just like two houses away. So she walked up, my, up to my door and she knocked on my door and I answered it. And she later, we told the story to each other, but she was intending to say something completely different to me. And she said that she was impressed to say, are you depressed? And that caught me so off guard because this is the gal that's like always jogging to keep herself fit and she's always throwing a party and she's always, you know, she's, her kids are beautifully dressed and she's got some awesome fashion sense and her husband is very cool. You know what I mean? She like, her life seemed like it was all together. And for her to then confide in me that she also suffered from depression shocked me. And it was the first time I realized I wasn't alone going through this. And so knowing that what you guys were going through with Hallie, it doesn't just affect the person going through it. It affects their family. I wanted to make sure that I reached out to you guys to make sure you knew that you weren't alone, that your kids weren't alone and help you kind of grapple through it. Cause it can be such a confusing time for the family that doesn't understand, well, what did I do? If I did something wrong, if I said something wrong, couldn't, couldn't I have just gotten the opportunity to apologize or fix it? It doesn't work that way. Yeah, it's you not know, like that. It's not like I, that at all. I want to touch on two things really quick that you talked about that I really is her coming up to your door, getting that impression. Yeah. So I really feel that each one of us has that I call it still a small voice. Yeah. You can call it intuition. I mean, it, it can have several names, but there's so many times when if you're doing something and you get an impression, you get a thought that pops into your mind like, hey, I should call so-and-so today and you yeah. haven't called that person for a year. That's there for a reason. Yes. And it is really important that you you listen to that still small voice because I, I can't tell you time after time, there's been so many times when I've gotten that little small voice and I go to one of my kids who was smiling and laughing that day and I'm like, hey, are you okay? Like, how was your day? Checking Tell me about them. it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they bawl. And I had the worst day at school. And this kid made fun of me. Yeah. And the son said. And it just like it starts this whole conversation. And they feel noticed and loved. But yeah. I've also had times when I haven't followed that. And, and I've regretted it later. Or sometimes you won't know. You don't know I mean what could have mm -hmm. happened had you followed it. But I just want to touch on that really quick. That if you are getting a that still small voice, your intuition is saying something, follow it. Call that person. Text somebody. Like all of those things. Definitely listen to that. Well, and a lot of people, I don't know if you know, like have experienced this, but we can see like two or three steps ahead of what the kid's doing. Right. You know what I mean? We see it coming. You know what I mean? We've been given that for a reason. Follow it. You know, if you don't feel good about the people that you're sitting next to in a restaurant, get up and move. You know what I mean? Like there's a reason that, you know, we're taking care of ourselves the way we are and that we are guarded and, and we just, we get that feeling in the pit of a stomach. You know, like, I always think of finding Nemo where the, she's following the light and she's like, good feeling gone. You know what I mean? And it just like it all of a sudden it just goes away, you know, but I remember one of the times that you followed that, um, a couple of years ago, it was, it was not exactly made clear on your channel, but when Hallie went to equine therapy, it was actually at my house Yes, um, and uh, was helping with all the animals and everything like that. Yeah. So you called me and you're just like, can I bring Hallie to you? And I, I can imagine as a mom how hard that sentence was. We were struggling and she yeah. was struggling and I was like, she needs something and we were right in the middle of moving moving in alex's to graduation here and alex's graduation yeah. and we had all of these things like back to back and i was like you know she needs like that therapy with the you know the horses and i feel like there's so many there's animals and all of that stuff that can do so much for somebody and i think that's why there's you know support dogs and service dogs and all of that kind of thing uh but so she was at carrie's house for two weeks and it made the biggest difference with being able to work with the horses. Well, I will I, say a lot about equine therapy. I, I just, 
when you called and said, can I bring Hallie? I didn't even think about it. I was just like, bring it, bring it on, come on down. And I'm pretty sure you left right away because you got there pretty quick. And it was that day that I actually had a baby horse born in my barn. And um, actually, Hallie was Asher's first date. Aww. Did you know that? I didn't know that. <laughs> well, I knew that they had gone on a date, but I didn't know it was Asher's first yeah, date. Yeah, it was Asher's first date. So, But anyway, it was it was a really good time. We, Hallie and I got really close, and that, that relationship with her and I, you know, continue to this day. And when you guys moved down... Um, and you started letting me know some of her other symptoms that she was having, I was just like, it sounds like she's got PCOS. Right. And we went to the doctor and she yeah, had her PCOS. Yeah. PCOS. So it just, it kind of like clicked in my head. So like, I feel like I was receiving inspiration and, you know, direction and guidance for somebody I love and care about, you know? And I will say when you are going through a mental illness, um, I have multiple times shown up at your house in tears and just, I need to talk and we'll go in your bedroom or whatever. And I know from my heart, whatever comes out of your mouth, whatever comes out of Aaron's mouth is meant with love. And no matter what I say, no matter what I've done, no matter what my experience is, when I leave, you're not going to love me any less. And I think that a really big tool that can help a lot of people with whatever mental illness they're struggling with is find your person. Right. You know what I mean? I think that's huge. Find yeah. your person that you can tell anything to and they'll love you anyway. You can right. be, you know, homeless under a bridge and they're going to love you anyway. You know, just whatever it is. Um, you know, when, what I went through a couple of weeks ago, I call Aaron and Crystal and they dropped everything and came running. I mean, they are my people, you know? So, right. I just. So, it, what about people out there that they can't or don't have somebody to talk to? There are support groups. There are, you can do it in person or online. Um, there's, there is a support group for almost every situation that you can think of. You just have to reach out. Um, talking to your doctor, getting on some right medication. It might take a couple of cycles to find out what is the right medication and what is the right dosage, things like that. Um, a lot of times it's an imbalance in vitamins, you know. Yeah. Um, so water, exercise, getting outside, getting sunshine. Um, vitamin B complex is co most commonly one that people are are insufficient on when they're having really deep episodes. So if you can if you can find a way to like level out your hormones and level out um, like spikes in your blood sugar, you know. So instead of multi, you know, eating like oh, so many people skip breakfast. You know what I mean? Right. If you can eat multiple times a day, it's going to level out your blood sugar instead of having these massive up and down spikes. And, and it'll, it'll help. It won't fix it, but it'll help. And so if this helps and that helps and this helps and you're attacking it from all sorts of different angles, you all of a sudden feel in control and empowered and you can recognize when those cycles are coming on and you have the tools to do something about it. Right. You know. So I would say, yeah, going along with that, if you don't have somebody to talk to, find a good therapist, find yeah. a support group, find somebody to reach out to, reach to out. figure out, you know what I mean? All of those. So let's talk a little bit about like coping skills and okay. kind of go into a little bit of how, if someone is struggling. So I do want to preface it really quick. Um, that none of us are like licensed therapists. Yeah, I was or just anything about to like say that. that. <laughs> yeah, this is just our personal opinion on yeah. what we have been through and what has worked for us. But everybody is completely different. Your situation is probably completely yeah. different, and it may look and feel different. So, if you can take something from our experience, you know that's really good. But also seek yeah. professional help for your situation for sure. in particular. So, okay. Yeah, coping skills. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Harley actually is letting me pet her. Right. So we Seriously. have a dog that's our podcast yeah. dog. For those of you who can only hear us, uh, she's, she always sits next to me. But she's the so fearful. Like I come through the door and she barks at me for like a half an hour. <laughs> I know. She's scared of her own shadow. So, she's just, yeah. But okay. So for, as far as coping skills, um, recognizing again, like when something is coming on and having the choice to act on it so 
um, I don't, I, I don't know if, I'll, I don't know if I can plug my channel real quick. Yeah, go okay. ahead. So I have a YouTube channel. I didn't want to like no, throw it in good. there. Throw it I in. have a YouTube channel that I've started not too long ago. So it's still budding and I'm still learning. And it's, you know, the editing is not yeah. near what the, the crazy pieces are. But it's called Our Stable Life. And um, a couple of videos ago, I actually was here in the studio right over there on that couch with Crystal and Joe talking about a really in intense trauma that happened to me with horses and I knew that this was bigger than me and I knew that I needed to get help right away it, like the longer I was going to wait the longer like the harder it was going to be the worse right. it was going to get and so let me say really quick so you can go to her channel really or go to her channel to find out more about the story we're not going to get into details of no. the story um but from the traumatic stuff that she had gone through she started having night terrors PTSD, she night started terrors, having yeah. panic attacks and she just still yeah so go but ahead I, I was i felt like i couldn't accomplish anything i couldn't do anything i wasn't cooking. I wasn't shopping. I wasn't cleaning my house. I wasn't taking care of my kids. I wasn't making my bed. I freaking wasn't brushing my teeth. Like everything in my life just, you know, stopped Yeah. because I just felt paralyzed in this experience. And it's, it's kind of like when you get in a car crash and everything seems to slow down. For me, it was slowing down and then being sliced into a, like a slideshow and I was replaying it on slow-mo. And I was replaying the worst of the worst slides, you know, and dwelling on that. And um, it, it, was, it was just more than I could take. And I, I ended up talking to a friend of mine who is a therapist in Scottsdale. And he actually owns um, a practice up there. And he's like, well, we have, I don't want to have that dual relationship because I also, he was a, a boarder of mine. And so can I send down my trauma therapist to come talk to you? And so it was like two days after this thing happened that I was able to get help right away. And on, being horse people, they understood that I was in the barn waiting for this mare to give birth and I couldn't leave. I couldn't come to Scottsdale to their office because what if she went into labor, you know? Right. And so she came to me in my living room, which was fabulous. That's so sweet. It was so fabulous. But she gave me coping skills that I had never even thought of as long as I'd been fighting this. So um, uh, a couple of them, when you're going right through the trauma and it's like in the heat of it and, you know, things like that, if you find a door or find a window and you breathe in through your nose as you go up the side of the window and then hold it as you go across the top and then breathe out through your mouth as you go down the bottom and then hold it across the, or go down one side and then hold it across the bottom. And if you actually do it, it's very similar to Lamaze breathing, <laughs> having a baby. Yeah. And so it like, when this whole thing happened and I was having to go from where this incident happened to the next location, I started to lose it and I had to call my mom and my mom on the phone was coaching me through my breathing because I was starting to hyperventilate. And I was driving. <laughs> oh, no, that's not. <laughs> and that's not a good combination. Yeah. So, um, you know, anyway, so controlling your breathing and getting to a point where you can, like, calm down and stop, you know, the the uncontrollable sobs that go along with a lot of trauma. Um, and then the next one she gave me was, it's called 54321. And I love it because... First of all, a lot of the viewers from uh, Crazy Pieces have come over to my channel, which I love. Welcome. Um, and a couple of them have reached out. I read you the comments today. Yeah. A couple of them re have reached out and they're like, we're going to go. I'm going to go and, and reach out to somebody and get help with this. And and a couple of people were like, yeah, I use 54321. You know, it, it works. So, um, so it's basically look around the room and find five things that you can see. Okay. So I see Aaron's microphone. I see a white pillow. I see Harley's ear. I see the pillow that I'm holding. You know, I see, I, I see I'm sorry. I see a really bright light in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Our studio lights. Okay, are your studio lights. So I don't have my glasses on, so I'm like, eh, you know. But um, 
Anyway, so you, you look around the room and you find five things that you can see. And then you go to four things that you can feel. So, Aaron, can you feel the fuzziness of that pillow? Yeah, Did you just try can. to pet your leg? Did you just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> like, do you feel your toes in your shoes? Yes. Okay. Do you, Crystal, do you feel the hair on your neck? Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Like anything, if you if you take your fingernails and you go like this and you scratch your own, the palm of your hand, you know what I mean? You can feel that type thing. And so just reach out and find something to feel. It kind of grounds you, okay? And then the third one is three things that you can hear. And I can't hear anything because I have headphones on. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear my voice. But, yeah, but the other day we were sitting on the couch and I was just filming on my cell phone and the kids weren't being quiet downstairs so we could hear Jamie singing yeah. and we could hear the dogs barking and we could hear the traffic outside and, you know, things like that. So, um, and then two things that you can smell and then one thing that you can taste. And the importance of what this does is it takes you out of what's called your lizard brain that's in the back, like the bottom of your brain stem. And if you went brain dead and all you could do was breathe, that is controlled by your lizard brain. It is basic functions, no more, okay? It is survival of the body, that is it. And the, the trauma that you're feeling it puts you in that lizard brain. It puts you in that reactive sense instead of like consciously making a choice. So five, four, three, two, one brings you out of your lizard brain and into the frontal lobe of your of your head in your brain here, and it gives you the ability to think and choose. What do I want to do with this trauma? Am I going to sit down and cry? Am I going to eat an entire package of Oreos? Please don't do that. I don't suggest it. <laughs> Um, am I going to call a friend? Am I going to, for me, what, how I kind of settle things for me, I go on horseback ride. You know, you have to figure out what works for you. Um, but making that conscious choice allows you to come out of the victim sense. You know what I mean? You, now you're starting to be in control of the choices that you are, you know, and the actions that you're doing to recover from this. Um, I had a choice to call for help. I had a choice to ask or, or accept that offer to get a trauma therapist. You know what I mean? That is a choice because sometimes people are like, oh, I don't want to put you out. That is the worst thing you can do. Right. I don't want to put you out. I don't, want burden to, on I don't want it to be a burden. You know, I just, I'm like, my arms are big enough for the both of us. Let's go. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's totally fine. So, um, and I, I will say that I love that about you though, is like, so Carrie called me during this traumatic event and like oh things gosh. she was going through and she was like, even though she knows like I have 16 kids, a business, like and we're doing all these different stuff. Like I am constantly busy yeah. most of the time. And, but I know if Carrie calls and she needs something, I'm going to drop everything for you. And I know that but too. But I love that you're like, didn't feel like you were a burden. Like you're like, Crystal, I need you right now. Like I need you. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like we're dropping everything. We're going and helping. And But even you couldn't, you couldn't have fixed it. No. You couldn't have, like there's so much stuff that you couldn't have done. But you told me through your actions that I was important to you, that my emotions were important to you. And even if the only thing you did was give me a hug and let me cry on your shoulder, which you did, you know what I mean? Um, I, I will have you guys know that she lied to me about being able to drive a truck. <laughs> okay, listen, <laughs> real quick, let me clarify that. So she had a, her truck and then it had a big horse trailer attached yeah. to it. She was shaking so bad from bad. what happened. She was not able to drive it. No. And so I was like, I'll drive it, but I had actually never driven a truck with a horse trailer, but I didn't tell her that in she the didn't moment tell me at because all. she was crying and shaking and there was, you know, and I was like, but we were less than like good. a mile we or two from my house. We weren't that far away. And I was like, I got this, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I got us there safely and I knew I was in a better state to drive than she was. Yeah, and you were. I was very cautious and very safe with it. But then I didn't tell. She was like, you've driven it before, right? And I was like, yeah, I had but, to lie to you in the moment. <laughs> I, and it was a little white lie and it was necessary. But I didn't yeah. find out about that until we filmed yeah, like, totally my filmed video. <laughs> and I was like, you, I cannot believe you did that. It was so crazy. But 
she stepped up and I, I can't imagine you're like, okay, I'm going to drive this big rig for the very first time. I can't let Carrie know that I don't know how to do this <laughs> right. because it's going to add stress on her. You stepped up to the plate and I am so proud of you for doing something scary oh, that's sweet. that day. Thank you. It, it meant a lot to me because I could, I was literally like, if you're, if you're watching the film, I was literally like this. I could yeah, not she was drive. Bad. It was so bad. So, um, anyway, so I want to get back to the coping skills because yes. she gave me one more that's super important. That is really, really good. Um, so find yourself somewhere that you can sit down and lay your head back either in bed or in a recliner chair or whatever. Um, and close your eyes and just take a big, deep breath in and a big, deep breath out. Keep your eyes closed. Actually, you know what? Why don't we do this with you two? Go ahead and close your eyes. Eyes, Aaron, go ahead. Okay. Crystal, go ahead. Okay. Okay. My eyes are closed. All right. Close your eyes. Take a big, deep breath in and a big, deep breath out. Let everything go. There's a bubble that is forming around your head and it's getting bigger and it's getting, it's getting to the point where it's encompassing you. It's warm and safe. It feels like you're sitting in the sun on an awesome day. Nothing is wrong in this bubble and you're completely safe. And it's getting bigger and it's getting bigger and it's enveloping you. This is a two-way bubble. You can push bad things out and you can invite good things in. Let come in the love that you have for your kids and the love that your kids have for you. Let come in your amazing fans and your family and your crew and your friends, your faith. Let all that come in. And anything that's bad, anything that's hard to deal with, push out. Separate those two. You have power to push that out. Now bring one thing. Pick one thing that's outside of that bubble and bring it in one at a time so that you can deal with it individually. It could be something bad somebody said about you. It could be a nightmare. It could be an, an insecurity. And deal with that. Tell yourself you're good enough and let it go. Now that bad thing has turned into power and a good thing. And it's just made your bubble bigger. I love that. I think Isn't that's that so powerful. I think so many times when I felt overwhelmed or I'm like, oh my gosh, and I'm having so much anxiety and yeah. I'm like, but I have all of these, once I think about it like that, like I have all of these things, but if I just had one at a time yes, and I'm like, okay, let me handle this. If it's not overwhelming, you figure can figure this yes. and then I can go on to the next thing and yeah. go on to the next and I can work through each thing individually mm -hmm. instead of too much as a whole. Yes. And it's going to give you that. power over your situation and it's going to give you confidence and self-healing and self-care. Self-care is so important. That's another coping skill. So a few years ago, um, when Asher, my oldest son is Asher, um, when he was in, I want to say seventh grade, it was like the, no, it was eighth grade. It was December of his eighth grade year, 2018. Um, so in September, my husband and I took a trip to Europe and we got back and my son was saying that he could not complete one entire play of football without having to go sit on the bench and rest. He couldn't seem to get a deep breath. And so we, we, I took him to all these doctors and everything and we found that he had something called pectus excavatum where his sternum is dropping into his chest and it's crushing his heart and his lungs. And he oh, wasn't, goodness. yeah, it was bad. And I had just lost all of this weight and I felt amazing. I had kept it off for like three years, but it was just a diet to me. It wasn't a lifestyle change. And I didn't really learn anything about myself other than the fact that I could deprive myself of food, right? So when Asher went through this very stressful situation, I started to eat my feelings. I was so scared for my son that the only thing I had control over was what I put in my mouth. And by the time he had surgery, a couple of months later, I had put like 50 pounds back on. You know, it was ridiculous. 
And I didn't really, I didn't even realize you sit there watching a movie and you're just like popcorn or cookies or chips or, and you, you just hand to mouth, hand to mouth, and it doesn't stop. And so being able to do these exercises gives you the control that, so that it doesn't go there. And so if you are feeding your emotions something, that's not going to make you healthy. That's not going to make you feel better about yourself. You know what I mean? You're going to gain weight. You're going to lose energy. You're, when, you, when you sleep too much, you feel more tired. So you keep sleeping. You know what I mean? So getting up when your first alarm goes off, not when your seventh alarm goes off. <laughs> Why do you look at me? Do, Crystal just wow. looked at me. Aaron, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. You've been good about getting up to your own. That was awesome. <laughs> he just loves his sleep. He loves to yeah. sleep in. So another thing is um, habit stacking. So if you're brushing your teeth, you could be listening to a fabulous podcast like Pieces of Us, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you are, you know, you could be reading a good book or your scriptures or anything while you're eating breakfast. You know what I'm saying? Um, habit stack. So if you're always brushing your teeth, you don't have to think about it. It happens every single day, first thing in the morning. If you habit stack it with something else that you have trouble doing, the one that you always do helps you remember to do the other. And then after so many days, that second thing becomes a good habit. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And so it gives you a lot more power that way. It could be every time I'm on the phone, I'm going to march in place. I'm going to get a little bit more steps in just to get my health up. You know what I mean? I am going, when my kids get home from school, instead of me sitting down at the table right away and giving them a snack, we're going to take the dog for a walk and I'm going to ask them about their day so that they feel they have that one-on-one -on -one time, you know? So another coping mechanism, count your blessings. Write them on a piece of paper so you can visually see it. So years ago, when I was in high school, my biology teacher would have us cover the same chapter in multiple different ways. The first day we would read the chapter. The second day we would answer the um, even questions in the back of the chapter. And then we would, the next day we would answer the odd questions in the back of the chapter. And then the next day we would define all of the highlighted words in the chapter. And on the fifth day we would have a test. And he had us cover that using a completely different part of our brain every single time. So when you write something out on a piece of paper, you're using one part of your brain. When you're reading it with your eyes, you're using another part. When you read it out loud and you can hear yourself, you're using a completely different part of your brain. So if you are counting your blessings and writing them out on a piece of paper and reading them out loud to yourself and posting them somewhere you can see them, like words of affirmation on your bathroom mirror, right? Where you get ready every day and you see it. That's if you, if you can combat it with a different part of your brain, then one part of your brain can't say, ah, you're not worth it. Cause another part of your brain's going, hold on. Look how many blessings I've got. Do you see what right. I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So that's, what's been really been working for me. Even now I get pretty depressed. I mean, I, I still go through some ebbs and, ebbs and flows. I am currently on medication. I don't foresee me go, ever going off. But there are times when I forget to take my pill and my kids will come to me and be like, Mom, have you taken your pill today? Oh, so and they can recognize. They, they recognize it, you know, and they don't mean it in a mean way, but they want their mom back. Not this monster that's taken over me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Does that help? That's really good. No, oh, I'm I sorry. Like, I don't mean No, that. I feel like that's really good. <laughs> I mean, those are some really great coping skills because I think a lot of people are like, learn coping skills, do coping skills, but they never actually tangible say what those coping that, skills that are. That word is such a big there's umbrella. Been, yeah. There's yeah. been so many therapists though that like we've taken the kids to for trauma and different things and that kind of thing. And, and I can tell usually within one to two meetings of meeting with a therapist on whether... It's going to be, I guess, I wouldn't say worth it, but whether it's going to make a difference or not, because mm -hmm. it will, especially with kids coming from foster care, a lot of times you get just a state um, therapist where 
I don't know. I've just, a lot of them that I've met, I mean, I know there's some amazing ones out there. There's been a few that I've met that it's just like a number to them. It's just like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, I'm just doing my job, but it doesn't yeah. feel like their heart is into it. And it doesn't yeah. feel like they generally like want to know and care and want to see them better. Yeah. And and maybe they do, maybe they don't show it. I don't know. It's all that kind of thing. And I think it's finding the right therapist for each individual person and what yeah. they feel comfortable with. But um, with that, there's so many that have said like, well, you just need to remember to breathe and you're not in that situation anymore. So you're fine. And like, and they... They downplay the kids' yeah. feelings, and I really struggle when I hear a therapist say that. That's, I'm like, we're done. That's, <laughs> that's not done. good. If you get into a therapy situation where the therapist is downplaying your trauma and not helping you address it or deal with it, run. Right. Run. I agree. They're there for a paycheck. They're not there for you. Right. Run. Yeah, for sure. So um, years ago, my son and I actually took Asher to a doctor, and this lady, I swear to you, she came in, she's looking at this chart, never once put her eyes on my son. Oh my gosh. She forced us to go and see a pediatric nutritionist because she called my son obese. We're what? talking about Asher here. Asher has always been a beanpole. Right. He's always been off the charts for his height and therefore he's off the charts on his weight. But if you look at him, he's always been proportionate. Right. So this doctor never looked up from her chart. And I literally had to call her attention to it. I said, could you please put your clipboard down and look at my child? This is the kid that you're talking to or talking about. You know what I mean? So, you know, just make sure that you're getting some really good references. You know, read the um, reviews online of, you know, other clients that they've had. Seriously be smart about it. Don't just go to whoever your insurance covers. Right. You know, that's, that's a big, big thing. Cause a lot of people don't know how many sessions it's going to take. Now I will say for me, because I got on it right away and I was able to work through it in so many different ways, I was able to talk about it with you. I was able to talk about it with my mom. I was able to talk about it with my therapist. I was able to talk about it with my husband, you know, and it took a long time of retelling the story before I could get through it without crying, without like completely losing it. But it was, I think, um, our third session. And I was like, I'm, I'm doing great. I feel in control of this. If I need you, I'll call you. You know, if you need more than that, you need more than that, right? But I really got that power back from, from what she taught me. I will contrast this with, before I found her help, for those of you that are religious, I felt the need to get a blessing from my church leaders. Um, so I called my father-in-law and my uncle over to give me a blessing. And before they did that, we were talking and my uncle, actually my husband's uncle, was a low level support fighter flight, uh, I can't say that, fighter pilot. In, on the Ho Chi Minh tra Trail in Vietnam. Oh, wow. And when he came home, he faced the whole, you're a baby killer, you know, that type. Like, there was so much uproar. Of, and he, they didn't offer help for the, the veterans back then. They didn't, they didn't help at all. You know, it was just deal with it, welcome home, glad you're alive, you know, go back to normal. And so many of these guys couldn't. Yeah. And it is how many years after Vietnam now? that my uncle is just now getting help. Oh, wow. You, do you see what I mean? And so he has been living through this nightmare over and over and over for decades and just now getting help with this. And it's taking a lot longer for him to process through his trauma and his grief and his guilt and, you know, all these other emotions that come up with that. I think that's why it's so important to talk about this topic yeah. and why it's so important to be open when it comes to things like this, because I feel like a long time ago, I mean, even when we were young, our parents, I mean, at least mine didn't talk openly about stuff no. like this and it was put, push it aside and suck it up. You'll be okay. You know, like, or they had that saying, real men don't cry. Like it's terrible that's and it awful. makes people feel so bad inside and like they are yeah. alone. 
And so I feel like that's the number one thing is to talk about it. And I think that that socially it has gotten okay to talk about it now. I love that. Because like, do you remember back when women used to have to go in confinement when they were pregnant? Not that you remember, but... I was like, you know, I don't really remember you that. You don't really remember it, but you know what I mean? I like, that, but... like yeah. it wasn't appropriate for them to be seen in public. Right. I know my were... mom said that she couldn't say I'm pregnant. You had to say I'm with child and she yeah. had to wear a baggy shirt. Like, yeah. she did say that. Yeah. Just So, look at where it's come to now, where we're doing maternity shoots where women show their belly bump. Right. And, you know, my, my sister-in-law, that woman, she'll run like a Ragnar marathon when she's eight months pregnant. Oh my gosh. I, she just blows my mind. You know what I mean? And it yeah. just, it's just part of life. And it's, you know, these stretch marks, I'm proud of those, you know, that type of thing. And so it's become a norm. It's become okay to talk about the same thing with mental health. You know what I mean? And the more you talk about it, the more you call a spade a spade and you can get help sooner the more you the more you can fix it when you internalize it it festers because your own your own your worst enemy and your your you are your own worst critic the internal dialogue and the narrative that you're telling yourself the one that is so untrue you're believing and there's nobody out there to combat there's nobody out there to say no that's not true hold on you're telling me a lie you know what i mean so if, if I came to you and told you that my husband was constantly telling me that I was ugly, was judging the clothes that I was wearing, was questioning my skills as a mother, was telling me that I'm horrible in the bedroom, like everything that you could possibly be telling me bad about myself, would you want me to stay with that guy? I would not. No, it wouldn't be a healthy relationship. So why is it that we're okay with when we sh see ourselves in the mirror in the bathroom and we tell we ourselves that we are ugly and we're not worth it and we're not enough? Why is it that we believe that? Why is it that we are okay with that narrative when it's us telling it to ourselves? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. That's so true. That just You've got to be so forgiving and so gentle on yourself and give yourself some grace. Give yourself some room to be imperfect. You know, my, one of my favorite sayings was um, that uh, I think this guy's favorite smell in church was a smoker because he was trying, you know. Because he was at church. He was at church. He, you know? Religion is He's not trying. for the perfect people. Christ did not come for the perfect people. He came for the imperfect people. Yeah. And I am as imperfect as it comes. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, you just, you have to be forgiving about yourself. Erin, I want to throw it to you really quick. You've been really quiet over been. there. I, I just want to say thanks to Carrie. Um, when I was struggling during Christmas, um, it wasn't until Carrie came over for a Christmas party and yeah. she took one look at me and she's like, I knew. She took me over in the corner mm -hmm. and sat me down and is like, all right, spill the beans. What's going on with you? Because yep. you are not the normal Aaron that I know. And initially you were like, oh, I'm fine. Uh, yeah, I tried not to talk yeah. about it. And I, I was like, BS, <laughs> don't even, no, you're not going to pull the wool over my eyes. <laughs> but we ended up having, I don't know, we sat and talked for probably an hour and a half yeah. in the middle of this Christmas party yep. when I'm supposed to be, you know, doing other stuff. And it was really helpful. And, and yeah. I just want to say thank you you're for so being there for me. And so... I hope it helped. Is there something in particular that you felt like helped? So for me, it was just somebody being and thinking about me and wanting to make sure that I was okay. Mm -hmm. Not that other people in my life weren't doing that, like Crystal and Joe and everybody, but it wasn't until Carrie recognized in me that I was struggling that I really let myself realize that I was struggling. Mm -hmm. Um, and at that point, I, f I feel like I was able to step back and really start working on myself. I wasn't trying to work on myself up to that point. I was just not yeah. talking about it. I just was trying to push it away and, and you know, go on my day to day. And it, it wasn't helping me. It wasn't making things better. It wasn't it wasn't getting me to where I wanted to be. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you finally sat down and talked to me and. The nice thing was it wasn't just that 
she talked to me in that day, she checked in on yeah. me. Yeah. Every couple of days, she would call me or text me and say, or when I would show up, I would you bring doing? you aside and be like, "All right, yeah. how's it is?" And I recommended a book that you didn't read. I'm. <laughs> he ordered. I it. started. It. I know. I now, know. I bought six copies of that book. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. But, um, that's okay. No, just just knowing that you weren't alone going through it. And that's and that's you what know? it was. You know, somebody reaching out and saying. I care about you. I care mm-hmm. about, you know, where you're at and just showing that, you know, I really appreciate Sometimes it. too, it does take like an outsider. I feel like when your family, your family's constantly like, yeah. are you okay? Is everything good? Like close. I can see you're struggling, but like, and he was like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm good. Like, and, but we could all see it, but it took someone from like the outside noticing outside and saying something. And I think that it, because she wasn't in the situation knowing like all the different things you were struggling with, but she was recognizing yeah. it. I feel like. But I also know yeah. how far I can push you. <laughs> like when you're, you know, poo-pooing me and, you know, saying, oh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm like, uh-uh, no, no. L- who are you talking to right now? Right. You know what I mean? Like, this is me. You're not going to get away with that. Spill it. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I just called you out and you have done that for me multiple times. I try not to. No, you're you, such a ahead. sweet lady. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've you have been a shoulder for me, and you give me a perspective of my husband or my son, or okay, this is how guys think, or you know, if this is the case, then you need to watch out for this, you know, that type of thing. Something that I would have never thought of. I know I have an experience in you telling me the truth, whether it's hard to hear or not. And so I am so blessed in the fact that. I don't just have Crystal as my person. I have Aaron as my person. I have Max as my person. I have Hallie as my person. You know what I mean? So like, look at what, when you, when I had a birthday party, you guys showed up and in droves, like you were half the party. You know what I mean? You, you, <laughs> you brought, brought the party. <laughs> you brought the party. It was fabulous. So, you know, it's, it's definitely a two way street, but you know, it, Crystal, you are right. It does a lot of times take an outside person. Absolutely. But you have to find that person and you have to trust in what they you say. You have to be able to trust it. Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing now, Aaron? Yeah, that's a good question. <sighs> I have my rough days. I'm, I feel, I, I think it's my mom's health is really what's bothering me the most. Um, my mom's dad had Parkinson's and I watched his decline and to his death. Yeah. And I, I just feel like I'm, I'm seeing that replay in slower motion with Mm -hmm. my mom. And so it's just been really tough. Uh, My mom and my stepdad have not always taken, Mm -hmm. you know, our suggestions and, and implemented them. And that's tough too, because it's, I see something going on and I want to help. I, 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 you know, I want to make it better, but. I want to talk about the emotions that you were going through right there really quick. Not again, not that I'm a therapist at all, (laughs) but the feeling that affected you most could you classify that as helplessness? You couldn't fix it? I would classify it as helplessness. I, I, I think it's a real struggle, you know, seeing somebody that I care for so much yes. decline. And there's really not Nothing much about that it. I can do yep. to change that. Yeah. And I guess the the hardest part for me is, you know, I do know that eventually she won't be here. Yeah. And it seems like that time is getting closer and closer. Mm-hmm. And it's just tough because as somebody gets older, you want, I don't know, I, I just keep thinking that there's she's going to say something to me that's going to be life shat- life shattering, life changing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm just waiting for that. And and so every time I see her, I'm, I'm just hoping that something's going to happen. I really love you and Joe searching that out in Beyond Crazy because you're not afraid to talk about your feelings. You're not afraid to make that a norm for men to be like, it's okay to cry. It's okay to feel insecure. It's okay to have these feelings. Does that make trying sense? trying to make me cry. I'm sorry. I don't mean to <laughs> be. I wouldn't do be, it. I wouldn't be able to see you cry because I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> I want those that need help to get help. I want those that feel alone to know that they're not alone. I want to help but if you find yourself being the helper don't let the help e drag you down 
it is so easy for you to just give and give and give. And if you're not refilling your bucket, pretty soon your bucket's dry. Do you see what I'm saying? Yep, I can understand that. So you need to be really careful that you don't let people take more than you can give. You've got to set boundaries if you choose to be the person for someone else. Okay, so that's that's really important. So I know that you and Shelly have gone through a lot together. And so Shelly is one of your people. I'm one of your people. Aaron is one of your people. So you're like, you build an army. You build this team. So when I was going through my trauma, I literally went through my phone and go, okay, who's the team? My mom, Crystal, Joe, you know what I mean? Like it, it was almost like you guys were on speed dial. So Crystal, have you ever struggled with mental health? Um, I have. So I had a little bit of postpartum in my last, or postpartum depression um, after my last serious pregnancy. Uh, But it didn't last for long, thankfully. Mm -hmm. I just had, I think that I went through that for a reason. And it happened to be right when Hallie started really struggling. Mm -hmm. And I, I got it. Because of that understood. situation. And I feel like I had a moment where we were in the living room and the kids were laughing and playing around and everyone's joking and Aaron's laughing over there and playing with the kids. And it was it was a really happy moment. And I remember feeling nothing. And I remember yeah. just feeling numb. And I I was like, I should be feeling happy. Like What's this is a me? happy moment. Yeah. And, and it was really a difficult, but at the same time, I, it clicked on me when Hallie then described how she was feeling. Mm -hmm. I was like, I felt that emotion. Mm -hmm. I know where you're at. And so I, I feel like it helped me with that. Um, but yeah, so it was just a time, it was a period. And then there was a time, um, when I was really letting, um, comments get to me. And there were people making up rumors and stories and this and that and whatnot. And and I started noticing it really quickly. And I, I think it was more anxiety more so than depression. Okay. Um, because I was just feeling like really anxious all the time. And I was feeling, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe it. But And then I wasn't as patient with the kids. And I was just noticing that I was on edge with mm-hmm. a lot of things. Um, so I did seek out a therapist at that point and I did go to therapy. I actually only did one session to be honest. Um, but the therapist was that good. And I, I don't know if it was just the one I needed to talk to. I don't know exactly, but it really only took me one session and she explained to me how those comments affect your mental health and how to look at the situation differently. And she just like went through it with me and I came out of that session totally different like you kinda, I, you're like oh why didn't I think of that right yeah. I was like what yeah. and you know like I don't know and so it just felt like I don't know so it just felt good and, but and it's not like therapy is like this faux pas like you know it is healthy like the healthiest people go to therapy on a regular basis right you know because your health is not just the number on the scale it is your mental health your financial health your social health your physical health you know, it's, it's your health and relationships. It's your ability to communicate and connect with others, right. you know? So like I, I, if, if you have one out of whack, so let's, let's pretend that you have a job and your goal is to make partner at a law firm, right? You're going to work all hours. You're going to give up going out with friends, you know, to, you've got this goal. I'm not going to go out to lunch. I'm going to order in because I'm at the office, right? Right. Well, you've just given up. You've gained your, your wealth, your, your, you know, um, financial health, but you've given up your social health. So a lot of people, when they're so focused on one, they're willing to sacrifice another type of health in order to get that one. And then when they get that one, they still feel out of balance. You know, it's so true. And so yeah. you have to like with horses, they don't have very much connective gray matter through their brain. 
And so what you do on one side, you have to repeat on the other side. Otherwise the horse is lopsided. You can literally train a horse all the time from just the left side and he'll be completely trained. But the second you walk around to that right side, he'll be like, who are you? I've never seen you before. Where did you come oh, from? That's crazy. You know what I mean? That's and, so interesting. And so they're so out of balance. So when I, when I have my horse do an exercise on the left, if I don't repeat that on the right, then he's out of balance. Sometimes, and we, we literally call it lefty and righty because he's, it's like you're training two horses. Okay. So it, he, he could be really, really good on the left and completely awful at that same exercise on the right. That just means the next time you do that, you need to work more on the right than you do on the left to bring it back into balance. Do you see what I'm saying? That's yeah. interesting. Same with your health. You've got to keep that balance because when, when one thing is so far out, it's like you have all these plates up in the air and you're juggling and you're like, I can't let anything fall. And if one thing falls, you feel like a complete failure in all of the other balls that you're keeping up in the air. You know what I mean? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I never looked at it like that. That's really eye opening because I feel like there's certain points that I can pick out like in our lives or in like the different situations where I'm like, okay, I feel good and I feel happy every day and I wake up with a smile and I'm excited for the day. And then it's like, um, you know, we started having different businesses work out and investments and like we had all of a sudden, you know, an influx in money and like on that side of it. And I was so unhappy. And I was like, Erin, yeah. like, why am I unhappy? Like, we're taking like care of like our house was paid, our bills are paid. And I was happier when we were struggling at yeah. one point than I am now. And we were like, what the heck? Like Aaron and I were so confused by, it, and we were both feeling that same way. But I think it's because we were out of balance mm -hmm. socially in our, like, you know what I mean? That part of our life because we were focused on this part. And Do you so ever notice that the poorest people are the most generous? Do you ever the, notice what? the poorest people are the most generous? I really, yeah. Do you realize that? They really are. Yeah. And my, I found out as an adult, I cannot believe this. Of course, it was the 80s, but still, I can't believe this. My parents raised six kids on like $35,000 a year. Oh, wow. Something like that. It might have been like 60 or something like that. But it, like we, we were raised with no health insurance. How? I, I mean, my brothers were constantly building um, go-karts and you know, tree forts and climbing trees and, and, and like 200 foot trees, you know, that type of thing. Like, how did we get through that without constant health insurance, you know? And we always found a way to adopt a family for Christmas or, you know, make a, a meal to take to a family in need or, you know, whatever, you know, you just, we, we didn't ever take amazing vacations. It was, behind an RV with a trailer full of our bikes and we went to the coast. You know what I mean? It wasn't, I think I, the last time I went to Disneyland, I was like eight, something oh, wow. like that. I'm okay with that. You know, Disneyland's a fabulous place, but it's not where my priority sits. So for a lot of people, where you spend your money is where your priorities are. If you like to go on cruises, go on cruises but your priority can't be your landscaping because you're constantly gone. Do you see what I'm saying? That's true. So if your priority is your family, if your priority is your health, you know, you, you get somebody that their priority is their physical health and they're constantly gym rats and they're just buff and ripped and you know what I mean? But they can't have a conversation with you because they're, they're just not social butterflies. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So be careful about taking it to one extreme or the other. So. Try to find a healthy balance, yep. but I think we're always trying to find balances because <laughs> I think it's a hard, a it hard is. one to figure out. So when I give uh, horseback riding lessons to kids, my very first lesson, they don't even touch the horse. I just talk to them because they need to know the rules of the barn and rules how how you act around a horse and things like that. And one of the favorite things that I do is I tell them the dynamics of the herd, the stallion, the mare, the, the pecking order, the hierarchy. Okay. And the best movie I know how to show that is Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron because it 
like the narration is spot on to the act and the horse's acting is actually how horses pin their ears at each other and you know things like that and so i the day one homework for a student is go watch that movie because that's horse body language you need to be able to read that body language in order to understand what the horse is trying to tell you and um i talk to them about balance there's balance in everything if you lose balance with horses, if you feed them too much or too little, if they get too much water or not enough, if you give them too much exercise or not enough, if you don't stay in the middle of their back, you're going to fall off when you ride. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so finding that balance, you know, and then I, at the end of the lesson, I tell them, if you can control a thousand pound animal, what can't you do? Aww. You know, and that's it just, awesome. I, I, I see these kids just all of a sudden like, yeah, that's right. You know, and I, I call them my interns, but you know, I, I take on kids that need a little bit of help. I had one gal, love her to death. Um, she was just an introvert. She would stay in her room and draw. She didn't even want to come out and do her chores. Like she was completely, perfectly fine being alone in her room. And her mom started bringing her to horseback riding lessons at my barn. And I was trying to get her to use her artistic skill to kind of pull her out of her bubble. And so I said, I want you to go home and research all of the different colors of horses. Draw me a picture of each one. And then the next time it was, draw me a picture of each type of saddle. So it was Western English racing, you know, that type of thing, right? And um, a couple of months into it, she had made a friend at school and she invited her friend over to my barn and took her friend out in the pasture and started teaching her friend how to put a halter on a horse. Aww. And it had nothing to do with putting on halter on a horse. It had to do with the fact that she was teaching someone else. She was reaching outside of herself and finding health in another aspect of her life. And she shows horses she sells amazing artwork. Um, I, she just, she has really come into her own. And I just sit by the sidelines and cheer her on. Oh, you know, that's so exciting. and that's, that's the best gift that she can give me as a thank you is you go do the best you, you know how, yeah. you know. I so. love that. I love that. That was just, that was awesome to me. But animals are powerful. If you have the opportunity to do any sort of animal therapy, volunteer at a shelter, anything like that, they, they are so healing. Not snakes, not lizards. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well. All right. We are going to go ahead and wrap this up. We could talk for hours we and could. hours. We really could. Sure. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining us on the Peace of Us podcast, and we will uh, catch you guys next time. Thank you so much for Bye. having me, guys. Bye. Bye. Peace.